Yo, yo, I'm Jovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to another Lakers postgame reaction show. I just got back from Ball Arena, where the Denver Nuggets beat the Lakers 101-99 to to take a 2-0 commanding series lead. The Nuggets ripped the Lakers' hearts out with a Jamal Murray buzzer beater. Uh, I've been to, uh, now it's 10 straight wins for the Nuggets. I've been to all 10 games and this was the most heartbreaking and gut-wrenching and any type of other adjective you want to describe uh, for the Lakers in terms of a loss. Like This was the worst loss of the 10 by far. Uh, LA led by 20 points with 10 minutes remaining in the third quarter. That was one of the best 26-minute stretches of basketball they played this season. Uh, they had a 15-point halftime lead. They score on three of the first four possessions in the second half. They go up 20. Denver calls timeout. And from that point on, L.A. was outscored 53-31 to 31 over the final 22 minutes of that game. And a very similar story to game one, a very similar story to previous matchups with the Nuggets. Uh, in this instance, I would say more similar to game one where L.A., Starts off hot. Remember in game one, they had a 12-point lead midway through the second quarter. Then Denver goes on a big run to get some momentum going into halftime. Then they go on another big run in the third quarter to uh, take a commanding lead. They were up by about double digits. And then from that point on, uh, LA got within single digits, but Denver was really in control for the rest of the game. In this game, though, LA was looking like they were putting Denver away. Denver was missing uh, layups. They were missing open threes. Uh, they were turning the ball over. Anthony Davis had possibly his best half of the season. Uh, he started the game 14 of 15. He had 32 points early in the third quarter. He finished with 32 points, did not score over the final 19 minutes of this game. And this was just a disaster class by the Lakers in terms of offensive execution. Uh, they stopped running their offense uh, to the degree that they were doing uh, for the first 26 minutes. Uh, the bench gave them nothing again. And LeBron really struggled until crunch time when he started to take over. But uh, it was a little too little too late. Uh, D'Lo had a hot start but faded in the second half. Uh, Austin Reeves struggled and, and was ice cold uh, and then started to make some shots late. But again, kind of too little, too late for L.A. Uh, so the Lakers are now down 2-0. And this, to me, feels more like 3-0. This feels like, you know, just given the history of this series, uh, given how much of a gut punch this was, and given just the mental demons that L.A. is dealing with, where no lead feels safe against Denver and they've now had these instances where they've blown really two games. Like you, you could make a case LA with how they started game one and how, especially game two. I think game two is obviously a worse loss and more of a blown opportunity. But to have a 20 point lead with 22 minutes left and to blow that and lose on a buzzer beater, uh, like that's, that's as rough as it gets. This to me, this was probably the toughest loss I've seen in person in my 12 years covering the NBA. I've been to hundreds of games as a journalist and then a beat writer, uh, both at Crypto.com Arena and on the road. This is my sixth season as a beat writer, sixth season traveling. And this is as tough as it gets. This is as much of a gut punch as I've seen in person. Because again, I think it's not just 2-0. It's not just Jamal Murray. It's not just blowing the game. It's the history of Denver has now won 10 straight against the Lakers. And if not now, if not this game, then when, right? Like, when are they going to beat them? They had one of 80's best halves of the season, one of, one of the best starts, probably the best start to a game this season for him. Uh, D'Angelo Russell hit a postseason uh, career high for him, tied a Lakers uh, franchise record for seven threes in a game. LeBron was making some big clutch buckets, uh, didn't ultimately make that final three where KCP fell, he had an open three, missed it with about 16 seconds left. Denver collects the rebound. Uh, MPJ got the rebound. They don't call a timeout. They bring the ball down the floor, and Jamal Murray uh, gets a jumper in front of the Nuggets bench to win the game and really just rip the Lakers' hearts out. And that's probably the series. I don't see the Lakers winning four of the next five games against Denver, especially when they've had 
such good stretches and then just gotten absolutely waxed in the remaining portions of the of the game especially when they've played fairly well i thought they played denver uh like take out that five to six minutes where denver denver had the 14-2 run in the second quarter and a 13-0 run in the third they outscored la 27 to 2 uh during the those stretches in game one and so you take out that like six seven minutes however long it was I thought LA was the better team for the first or for the remaining 40, 41 minutes. You look at tonight, LA was the better team for the first 26 minutes and even was trading blows in crunch time. And it looked like it was going to be an ugly win, but LA was still going to figure it out. Remember LeBron hit a couple threes to make it 99, 91. And that was uh, the end of LA scoring. They didn't score the rest of the game and they were outscored 18 to 10 uh, over the final four minutes and change. Uh, So, I'm going to go through the numbers quickly here. Really not much to talk about in in terms of like production and and performances just because that stuff kind of doesn't matter right now. Uh, But quickly, AD had 32 points, 11 rebounds, two assists, one steal, one block. Uh, It was 14 and 19, started 14 and 15. So he missed his final four shots. And really, LA went away from him once Denver... So Denver made a smart adjustment of putting Aaron Gordon on Anthony Davis uh, because the Lakers were targeting Nikola Jokic in pick and rolls. They're having a lot of success with it. And they tried to uh, switch him onto Rui Hachimura and and put uh, Aaron Gordon in uh, on Anthony Davis. And the Lakers just continued to target Nikola Jokic and have success with it. And that was partly how they built that 20 point lead. And that was partly how they were continuing to score into the third quarter, uh, but went away from AD uh, Denver credit to them of Jokic, Gordon, like those guys handling him and, uh, you know, not letting him get to the rim and, and forcing him to be a jump shooter in the second half. But again, uh, AD, I want to say, took only four or five shots in the second half. And uh, that is just uh, that. I mean, that's just that can't happen. Right. Uh, maybe maybe it was a few more. It might, might have been six or seven. But but even that, I think he started 11 to 12, 12. He was either 11 or 12 or, or 12 or 13 at halftime. Uh, I just got back from the arena, so I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I will be able to speak. Uh, more in depth when I do my follow up to game two in terms of adjustments for for game three, uh, but AD like that was arguably the best again half of his season. He was guarding Jokic. The, the Lakers made the adjustment to switch Anthony Davis onto Jokic. Uh, they also had uh, they put Rui on MPJ and, and sort of simplified his defensive responsibilities. As I talked about on Buha's block uh, with Sean Davis, I felt that uh, LA needed to simplify Rui's responsibilities and and that Denver was really targeting him with DHOs and pick and rolls when he was guarding Jokic and making him have to make split second decisions, which isn't necessarily uh, Rui's strong suit defensively. So I thought that was a smart, like it was exactly what we predicted uh, and what I suggested LA do was I said, you should put 80 on Jokic, have him uh, be involved in the DHOs and and the two man game and and the pick and rolls. Uh, They did that. And he did a great job against Jokic in the first half. That was maybe Jokic's worst half against the Lakers that uh, I can remember. Like he was uh, missing shots and and he was being a bit passive and uh, he had some uncharacteristic turnovers, but he he was missing those bunnies uh, and point blank shots that he typically makes. Uh, Then you you had LeBron on Aaron Gordon. And I thought LeBron as the low man, as the helper uh, was able to hang around Gordon and still be a physical body to to put on him uh, on the offensive glass. Uh, but also, you know, LeBron is, uh, when he's at his best defensively, he is a disruptive help defender and his ability to poke at, uh, dribbles and, and, you know, box out and, and just be a disruptor down there. Um, I thought he had some, some good stretches, uh, especially in that first half, uh, Rui, this was one of Rui's worst games in memory. Uh, he was one for seven, missed several point blank shots, several layups, uh, 0 for two on threes only had five rebounds. So like that's a step up from game one, but LA needs Rui more engaged. Rui's been pretty passive. And to me a little, Rui's been pretty passive uh, through these first couple games and just not playing with the force, uh, the requisite force that LA needs him to play with. LeBron really struggled to start. Uh, He started four for 11, uh, but finished with 26 points, eight rebounds and 12 assists, nearly had a triple double, uh, two steals, two blocks, uh, finished nine and 19 overall. 
hit three threes, uh, did miss a couple free throws, and missed that shot. That would have been the game winner, or at least the go-ahead shot with about 16 seconds remaining. Uh, but LeBron, I, I thought it, it was an impressive clutch performance from him. I, I think L.A., Needed a little bit more of that earlier in the game, but he hit, again, a couple of big threes, uh, had an and one against KCP, ended up missing the free throw, uh, but he was in prime playoff LeBron mode in terms of mismatch hunting and, uh, again, the 12 assists, like he was dissecting the nuggets in the pick and roll and finding AD, finding shooters, finding D'Lo. Uh, so, like, from an offensive perspective, I thought a, a pretty good LeBron game and also as I noted uh last game uh that was the third time within the nine game losing streak that LA had had LeBron and AD both go for 25 plus and this was now the fourth time in the 10 game losing streak Uh, also the sixth time that they've lost a clutch game to Denver in the 10 game losing streak uh D'Lo bounced back 23 points 8 of 16 shooting 7 11 uh, 7 4 11 rather from three uh three rebounds six assists And he continues to struggle inside the arc. Uh, He was just one for five on two pointers. And I I think that the final thing for D'Lo in terms of uh, adjusting or, or, uh, you know, and the final thing for D'Lo, in my opinion, in terms of an adjustment is just cutting out some of these mid-range pull-up and and floater shots that he is taking largely contested, uh, whether it's over Jokic or or Aaron Gordon, or he has uh, his defender... Uh, rear view contesting or, or trailing him like he's really struggled inside the arc he had a huge floater late uh and i i should have uh i said lebron scored the, the final basket it was actually no D- dlo scored during the run lebron had a couple threes and then um i want to say lebron had the final basket if i'm not mistaken uh but dlo had a, a big runner to uh the game was tied at 95 95 and dlo gets a runner and makes it 97 95 with about a minute left so that was a big shot from deal so the, the one two-pointer he hit was a really big shot uh, again i'm nitpicking when a guy goes seven for 11 from three sets a, a, a career record sets a franchise record like it, it's hard to find things to i thought his defensive effort too was better like still got picked on a bit uh got lost in in terms of switches and coverages and, and rotations but uh a, a better two-way effort certainly from delo he rose to the occasion. Uh, I just think the final, like with every possession really mattering in this series, the final thing for D'Lo is he's he's got to stop forcing some of these inside the arc shots around the elbow and around the charge circle. Uh, Austin Reeves had a, another quiet game offensively, just nine points on four for 11 shooting. I will say that I think uh, he's done well in the Jamal Murray matchup, all things considered. Uh, I'm going to look it up now. Murray finished nine for 24 again. So he's gone nine for 24 in both matchups against the Lakers uh, to start this series. And you will take that uh, 10 out of 10 times. And a big part of that has been Austin Reeves, and he's been the primary defender. Uh, Gabe Vincent has got some looks uh, against Jamal, in the se- especially in the second quarter. Uh, Spencer's got some time on Jamal, but really it's been Austin as the primary guy. Uh, again, I, I don't know the matchup data yet off of that, but I'm, I'm sure he's he's done a fairly good job uh, dancing with Jamal on the perimeter, uh, rear view contesting, chasing around screens, uh, and, and fighting over screens when it's the two-man game with uh, Jokic and Murray. So Austin it, it had six rebounds, and I thought he stepped up as a rebounder as well in terms of cracking back and being more physical. Like he was third on the team in rebounds behind just LeBron and AD, uh, had more rebounds than Rui. Uh, so, like, I think that there's still some intangible uh, positives for Austin, but the Lakers need, and he did hit a couple of big shots in the fourth quarter, especially one late. Uh, I still think the Lakers need more from him offensively. And they were able to to go to him more in, in that first half. I thought they were having him uh, dribble the ball up more and, and run more pick and roll. And like it was some of the things we talked about on the adjustment show, uh, but it still wasn't enough. The bench continues to just be a giant minus. And LA's really relying on like five guys right now. Uh, Torian Prince did hit a couple threes, took a terrible step back three though. Uh, in the fourth quarter, only had three rebounds in his 22 minutes. Uh, it continues to be just not really a difference maker defensively or on the glass. Uh, he got scored on several times in transition and, and just guys going downhill against him. Uh, so I, I think like the, the threes are nice, but he's still to me a, a net negative in, in my opinion. And, and 
maybe I'm wrong on that, but that's just that's just how I see it. Uh, Jackson Hayes played six minutes. Darvin hinted that he was going to play more. That was not the case. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie went from 13 minutes down to 10. Uh, had a couple steals. I, I thought played largely good defense, but it was 0 for 1, uh, and, and he's just done nothing offensively. Uh, Gabe Vincent played a little bit more, went from 8 minutes to 15, but went 0 for 2, missed uh, two threes, uh, one rebound, one assist, one steal. And LA's really losing the bench minutes. Like Jackson was a minus 1, uh, Spencer was a minus 9, Gabe was a minus 6, and those stretches in the second and like late third, early fourth, uh, just don't that they've not been going well and LA like really I mean it might be a situation where like you got to play the starters like 40 plus minutes like everybody right and and you really tighten it to a little bit of Tory and a little bit of Gabe and maybe like a shift of Jackson and that's it like I, I don't know if you keep going with Spencer with the way that he's played over the first couple of games uh, I like Gabe, Gabe has done a good job against Jamal I want to give Gabe a, a shout out for that I think he's he's held up as as well as uh, is reasonably possible. Quickly on the Denver side, uh, Jokic had a triple-double, 27 points, 20 rebounds, and 10 assists, uh, 9 for 16. So he, he, I think he started something like 4 for 8, uh, so he ended up going 5 for 8. Uh, I think he was 4 for 8 in the first half, 5 for 8 in the second half. Uh, hit a bunch of big shots, got to the free throw line, 7 to 7 there, a couple steals, but did have three turnovers. LA forced Denver into more turnovers. Uh, after uh, Denver's starters had one combined turnover in game one, they had four. They had eight turnovers in game two. Uh, eight of the team's nine. Uh, Jamal Murray had 14 points in the fourth quarter. Really struggled. Like he was really struggling for the first three quarters. Uh, scored 14 of his 20 in the fourth. And Michael Porter Jr. hit a. Felt like every three he hit was a momentum changer, especially in the second half. He tied the game at 95-95. It was the first time it had been tied since the first half. Uh, he had nine rebounds. Uh, and Denver only had nine offensive rebounds, but still nine is nine is high, especially compared to LA only had four Denver won the rebounding battle 45 to 38 and they won the free throw battle, which really hurt LA. Uh, Denver was 15 to 17. LA was 10 for 13. LA won the three point battle though, uh, 13 of 30 versus Denver being eight of 30. Uh, Denver again, won rebounding battle. Denver won the turnover battle 15 to nine and scored 13 outscored LA 13 to 9 in terms of points off turnovers LA won fast break points 15 14 but Denver won points in the paint 54 38 so Denver continues to win in a lot of the same fashions uh, they're dominating the glass they're dominating points in the paint they're dominating turnovers they're dominating the possession battle uh, and they took only 10 more shots than the Lakers they took 23 more shots than them in game one but you look at 10 plus shots uh, or 10 shots rather, and four extra free throws, like that's that's a lot. And, and it's hard to beat any team losing the possession battle that decisively, but to beat this team and to beat this team, and, and like Denver didn't even shoot, like they shot 44% overall, they shot 23.5% on threes, and they still won this game. LA shot 49% and 43% on threes. Again, 13 threes. Uh, had a much better shooting performance, nearly doubled their three-point total from game one and still lost. And and that's where this is just such a gut punch for the Lakers. Uh, but let's get into our three takeaways. Quickly, before we get into things, I just want to say if you've been enjoying my post-game reactions and Buha's block, uh, I would appreciate if you considered subscribing to my YouTube channel and following on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and your podcast platform of choice. I would really appreciate it. So takeaway number one for the Lakers is 2-0, and that is the series deficit that they face now. And it is a daunting hole. As I said earlier, it feels more like a 3-0 series deficit uh, rather than a 2-0 series deficit, just given the history of these teams, given the streak that the Nuggets are on right now, winning 10 straight, uh, winning 10 straight in the fashion that they've done so. Uh, again, as I said, six games that have gone into the clutch. This was an absolute heartbreaker for LA, but an absolute confidence booster for Denver that no matter how much they're down by it, they can beat the Lakers. Like this was, if, if game one wasn't that, right? It, with LA getting off to that hot start and not being able to sustain it and not being able to sustain it, this is like, we could be down 20 points in the second half and there's no amount of time left and still down whatever, eight points with a couple minutes left, a few minutes left and still be able to 
rally and beat this team. And Denver has all the confidence in the world against the Lakers now. I mean, if they didn't already have it with nine straight games and they've been very cocky and brash and very open about uh, the, how comfortable and, and confident they are in this matchup and whatever, if the bar was not at 100% before, it's at 100% now. And for LA, I don't see how you get over this mental hurdle. Like I, I just, even a 20 point lead in the second half isn't safe against the Denver Nuggets for the Lakers. And this was just such a gut-wrenching uh, heartbreaker that I, this might be the death blow of the series. I, I don't want to say the series is over, but the Lakers have to win four out of five times when they have not beaten this team in 10 straight games and have consistently lost in the same way. And I just, I just don't see it. Like I, I don't want to say it's 100% over, but... It feels like it's 99% over. It feels like it's just there. And whether it's a sweep or whether it's in five games, I don't see how Denver doesn't get at least one in LA. Like this, this feels like it's a, it's a four or five game series now. And LA needed, like LA needed to get one in Denver. They were right there. Even with blowing the 20 point lead, it could have just been an ugly game that they learned from. And it was one of those situations where it's like, okay, we got to go back and watch the film and, see where the offense turned and, and see how we can counter Denver's counters and see how we can attack Jokic more and uh, keep Murray as the, they, they did a good job of, of having uh, Murray as the low man and having Austin in the weak side corner. So Murray would have to help uh, on LeBron AD pick and rolls. And they were able to get uh, score over him, get fouls or get offensive rebounds and only had four, but like they were able to leverage Murray as, as the weak point. And I thought they, they pointed, they, they really pointed at the, the two weak points of Denver's defense, which have been, uh, Jokic and Murray and I think both guys are underrated defenders and like Murray has good size and strength for the point guard spot he's not the quickest or most athletic guy he's not a plus defender per se but he can use his length and, and size and strength well and then Jokic uh, as I've said before leads uh, one of the league leaders in deflections uh, the leads all centers in deflections and uh, his rim protection numbers aren't like terrible like you know he, he's had decent rim protection numbers uh the last few years and obviously was, was good enough for denver to uh, win a championship and and go 16 and 4 in the playoff so I, i'm actually going to tweak this on the fly i'm just going to say my takeaway is 2-0 but feels like 3-0 like that's just what it felt like the lakers are, are going to have to play perfect basketball uh, to, to win this series and you have to take it one game at a time. You have to come out and try and win game three, and that's what they're going to do. And that was the message from uh, Darvin Ham and LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Uh, but everybody was dejected in their own way. Darvin was visibly upset. Uh, you could see it in his eyes. He almost looked a bit teary-eyed when he sat down. Uh, LeBron was pretty measured in his commentary, although he did go off on the NBA replay center at the end of his availability, but he, he was obviously upset. Uh, D'Lo had sunglasses on and played it cool as he does, but also kind of talked about the officiating. Austin was as Austin is, uh, but pretty down and Austin's down after every loss. It doesn't really change. Uh, he even mentioned that, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a buzzer beater playoffs, whenever, like he, He's just a competitor who never wants to lose, but AD was the most upset. And I, I think this really spoiled what was about to be a special night. Uh, Anthony Davis was overlooked in the defensive player of the year conversation. He was not one of the three finalists, which the NBA announced on Sunday. And AD again came out with, uh, with a fire under his ass and uh, was taking it to Jokic, was scoring over him consistently, scoring over Aaron Gordon, scoring over the entire Nuggets defense, hitting jumpers, looking as confident as ever, and then also really disrupting Jokic and uh, doing uh, you know defending him in the post well and uh, con contesting his shots well, poking at the ball, and just making him ineffective in that first half. So it was but still might be like the best half of basketball 80s played all season. And that's saying something given that he's been the Lakers best player, uh, but it's all for naught. And, and honestly, the Lakers are going to have to figure some things out just to win a game in this series, because I, I think they're going to have to tighten the bench. Uh, I don't think they can go like they close the first quarter with uh, Torian at the four with three guards. Like this is not, this is not the team to do that against uh, Denver only outscored them two zero in that stretch. But um, it's like a minute and a half. Like you just, this is not a team to go small against. I don't understand that. But um, the LA is facing, they were already facing long odds to win this series, but now being down 2 0 and having their soul snatched in the manner that it was, 
Uh, this, this feels more like 3-0, and this feels more like a four or five game series at this point. Takeaway number two is deja vu. And you could also say Groundhog's Day because we've seen this movie before. This is what Denver does, and this is what Denver does specifically against the Lakers. Denver finished the game going seven for seven. They made their final seven shots uh, over the, the final four plus minutes. Uh, LA went five for eight in that stretch. So still 62.5%, like a pretty good showing in crunch time for LA, yet they were still outscored 18 to 10 over that period. And of course, Jamal Murray gets the game winner. Anthony Davis was right there, outstretched arm. Uh, not much you could really do. And, and that was just a tough shot by one of the best uh, playoff risers in NBA history. Currently has the uh, one of the biggest uh, scoring increases in terms of from regular season to the playoffs in Jamal Murray. And also has the highest uh, career playoff average in the fourth quarter, which he continued with his 14 points and hitting big shot after big shot. Got to the free throw line uh, against LeBron, which was a controversial call. And that's another thing I should probably uh, have mentioned a little bit earlier, but there was a lot of controversy in this game. Uh, Denver had two challenges that were overturned, uh, which had looked like in the moment uh, calls that were should have been in LA's favor. The, uh, one I, I think of is D'Angelo Russell, the, the drive uh, against MPJ gets hit in the face and looks like a foul upon the replay, but the league overturns it or the, the replay center and, and the referees overturn it. And the you know, LeBron goes off on the replay center after the game of just, he doesn't understand it, doesn't understand the inconsistency with it. Darwin went off on the officiating. Uh, then you have Jamal Murray uh, draw a foul on LeBron with about 57 seconds left to tie the game at 97. Uh, I want to say 97-ish, 97, 99, I think 97. Uh, but that was one where I think Darwin probably should have uh, challenged it. And the fact that he didn't challenge it uh, the fact that he exited or ended the game with two timeouts, your timeouts do not transfer. They do not, you don't get two extra timeouts uh, into the next game. And that, that's been a consistent theme. It's one of the most frequent questions I've gotten from fans on Twitter and YouTube and just in general of the timeouts and the timeout usage. And uh, Darwin has talked about, he believes in the Phil Jackson philosophy of letting the team play through it. And that's one thing, but when the game is on the line, and this is one of those calls that uh, could make or break uh, the the game. Like you, you, I think you have to call a challenge there. And even if it's unsuccessful, you do lose a timeout, but you still had one left. And, and Darwin has talked about the value of timeouts and, and how he really likes having at least a couple within the last couple minutes to play with in, in terms of a situation and, and calling a timeout. If, you know, if a guy gets trapped along the, the baseline or the sideline or whatever, like you can call a timeout. Or uh, if they, they hit a big basket to take the lead or to tie the game, you can call a timeout and call something up. So like I get it from that perspective, but I, I think in this case, that was one of those iffy calls where I still don't know if that was a foul on LeBron. I, I've only seen one side of the replay. I haven't seen like the other side. Uh, and, and I heard from someone that the other side, it looks more like a foul. So maybe that would have been a mistake to challenge that. But I, I think there should have been a challenge from the Lakers uh, on that possession. But again, like the Lakers lose this takeaway is the Lakers lose in crunch time again. And it was not quite a disaster class from LA in terms of crunch time execution, because I, I thought LeBron uh, had several buckets and, and was getting good looks. Austin had a, a key pull-up jumper uh, on the right side. Uh, D'Lo had the runner. Uh, like, not enough AD. That would maybe be the one critique. But Aaron Gordon did a really good job locking into AD and really shutting him down in the second half. And Denver, just as a, a whole, was doing a really good job collapsing a, on AD and then rotating and, and closing out and getting out to LA's uh, shooters and, and as they were kind of moving the ball. So uh, really, like, I, I think... Lost in all this, Denver played a, a really impressive second half, and for them to uh, hold LA to again 31 points over the final 22 minutes, like that is a on, on one hand, it is an indictment on LA and their crunch time offense and just their second half offense in general. But I do think Denver, the coaching staff, uh, the players, them making some of the adjustments that they made, defending the LeBron AD pick and roll and two man game, like they deserve some level of credit for that 
it wasn't just LA completely collapsing and and blowing this. Denver made a bunch of big plays, a bunch of big shots, but that's been this that's been the whole series, or you know, in, in not just this series, but the conference finals and the regular season. Like that's what Denver does, and no matter what happens, Denver is always just a possession or, or often several possessions because they've won several of these games by double digits. Uh, they're just a few possessions better than LA in this case. It was just one possession, one shot. I also, I would say another thing, like I think some of the timeouts could have been used a little bit better in the second half in terms of stopping the runs. Like Denver went on, um, it, it was really like the lead was slipping away. Denver was chipping away at it. They'd go on like these mini 5-0, 7-0, 7-2, uh, whatever runs to cut it to 15, to cut it to 13, to cut it to 11, to cut it to nine. They kept just chipping away at it methodically in the second half. And I think LA could have done a better job again using maybe even just one time out a little early like in, in certain spots I, I have to rewatch again but that's just uh, off off the top of my memory but deja vu because denver just beats or, or groundhogs day denver just beats la in the same ways this one was a bit more dramatic given the 20 point lead and the, the 20 point swing and how well la had started the game and it had played uh, up until the third quarter but really just came down to again a crunch time situation Denver made literally all the shots. They did not miss. And I've heard from people in, in previewing the series, whether it be Laker fans or Lakers media or, or Lakers personnel, uh, Denver can't make all the shots that they made in the conference finals. And or, you know, do the same thing again in crunch time, do the same thing again where they just go through these shooting stretches. And uh, I would point to the regular season. Michael Porter Jr. going 10 for 10, 5 for 5 on threes. Uh, some of Jokic and Murray's shot making in the regular season. Then I'd look at game one and game two and the runs that they went on and the crunch time in this game. Like, I don't see how you write that off or, or dismiss that as fluky or just not part of Denver's DNA. Like, that, that is, that's part of their DNA. They make, they're an excellent crunch time team. They led the league in net rating lakers had the best win percentage in the clutch denver had the best net rating they were the most dominant team in the clutch even if it didn't reflect that in terms of win percentage they were i believe third in win percentage uh or might have been might have been eighth i don't remember off the top of my head now i'm rattling so many numbers off but i know they were first in net rating had a plus 24 net rating uh in, in the clutch in la was uh, i want to say eighth or ninth in that so uh la despite like la won a lot of close games and that that is impressive and but i think looking at like the net rating it's clear denver's just dominant in the clutch and, and now we have the sample size of if it's a close game i'm picking the nuggets like i, I don't see how la wins a, a close game against this team it's just that's been six of the ten games where murray and, and Jokic become superhuman and hit everything and the lakers can't even Lakers shot 62% over the final four minutes and still lost because Denver made everything. So uh, deja vu, Groundhog's Day, it just it keeps happening over and over again. And finally, uh, takeaway number three is, and I'm going to quote Anthony Davis here, there are stretches where we don't know what we're doing on both ends of the floor. And that to me was a pretty damning quote. And I'm not sure if that's a shot at Darvin Ham. It seems like a shot at Darvin Ham uh, and the coaching staff uh, could also be a shot at his teammates and, and certain guys just uh, not knowing the playbook or, or you know, low basketball IQ, whatever. But that was a shot at someone. And uh, Anthony Davis has, you know, as I've covered him now for four years, uh, I've learned he does not mince words. And he is often the truth teller of the locker room. Like LeBron will often default to his experience and his wisdom, and there's no moment too big for him. There's nothing he hasn't overcome or, or faced, and and that obviously 21 years, all the scenarios, more minutes than anyone, more games than anyone, uh, more points than anyone. Like LeBron can speak from that perspective, and and Darvin is going to put uh, his sheen on things, and, and he's uh, an optimist and is always going to be talking through cliches and, and talking about energy and effort and uh, 
we'll sometimes get technical with X's and O stuff, but for the most part, we'll talk in generalities and then going on and on down the list. Like D'Lo can be short with his answers and uh, can be a little bit defensive if we start talking about his struggles or, or what he needs to do better, whatever. Like in, in general, he's a, he's a bit thorny with the media. Uh, Austin is very media friendly. And even tonight, I, I thought held his composure very well. But Austin, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll talk short as well and, and kind of keep things a little bit more general. Like 80 is often the guy who just calls it like it is, calls it like he sees it, uh, just tells the truth in the media. And he'll call out himself, he'll call out his teammates. Uh, even, you know, whenever we ask about him or or the scheme or whatever, like he'll, he'll, he'll you know, be as honest as is reasonably possible uh given his status and and given uh his stature within the locker room and how much his voice can carry uh so i thought 80 saying that and saying that the the reason they lost this game because there are these stretches that they go through where they just don't know what they're doing on either end like we're we're in game 85 uh or 80 we're in game 86 actually uh 82 regular season games 83rd with the in-season tournament, 84th with the play-in, now two plus. So we're at game 86, and your best slash second best player saying that you guys have stretches where you don't know what you're doing on either end of the floor is a problem. And to have that said in a playoff game this late into the season, and the Lakers can push back with their continuity stuff and the injuries and uh, all, all the excuses that have been made at various points this season. But to me, that is an inexcusable sentiment. It is a true sentiment. If you watch the games, you see there are these stretches where, like in game one, it was very apparent with the the 14-2 run in the second quarter and the 13-0 run in the third quarter. Like those were clear-cut stretches. To me, it was a little bit more methodical, but LA really just let go of the rope in the second half. And it wasn't just effort. It wasn't just missing shots. It it wasn't just being tired because Denver was tired. Like, L.A. looked tired. They looked gassed at, for stretches, but so did Denver. And, and Jokic, uh, you know, I, I didn't see the play, but people were saying he tweaked his ankle in the first half and was kind of limping. And, like, there was stretches where he, he was not himself. This was not an A game from Jokic. Just crazy because he had 27, 20, and 10. But, like, it was right there for L.A. to take. And their execution in the second half was just not there. And Denver was the team making the adjustments, and L.A. struggled to counter. And they, at first, continued to target Jokic and go at him and uh, successfully score uh, on that. But the offensive execution, some of the lineups in the second half, the the lack of timeouts, the, uh, you know, not challenging that uh, foul against uh, on LeBron against Murray. Like there was just so many mistake and and process uh, and organizational things that won against the Lakers. I I think defending Jokic, like they'd had some success defending him with, with double teams from certain spots on the floor. They let Rui guard him one-on-one for stretches of the third and the fourth where he just cooked Rui and was scoring on him bucket after bucket. And and part, part of that was AD got in foul trouble. I, I don't remember if I mentioned that or not. So AD had ended up with five fouls and had three fouls at one point in the first quarter, or I mean in the first half and then four in the, the third quarter and then had to sit. And like that certainly impacted the game. And, and Darvin Ham made that clear afterward that that was a big part of this. But... I just to have a quote like that, uh, like there, there's like there's so many other things I could touch on w- within this game, but to me that was like that encapsulated it, right? Like the the fact that this has been a thing all season where the Lakers, the the three and ten stretch in the in season tournament, uh, just the the stretches that they've had of inconsistency and mistake prone basketball and not looking like the most organized team on both ends of the floor. This has been a consistent theme all season. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's now coming back to bite them against the arguably best team in the league and certainly the best team in the league from an execution standpoint. You have to play perfect basketball to beat the Denver Nuggets in the playoffs. And the Lakers have had an 18-minute stretch where they played near-perfect basketball and a 26-minute stretch where they played near-perfect basketball. And then the rest of the stretches were, I mean, in the second half of of game two and, uh, again, those runs in in game one, like, those were just disastrous stretches that really cost the Lakers. And uh, I don't think you can – like, Denver continues to run their stuff, and it's just a matter of do they miss or make shots. And – 
but they're they're always uh, everyone is running their lanes and making their cuts and in the right spots on the floor and making smart adjustments and defensively they're they're in their spots and they're calling out their coverages and you can see their rotations that they're on a string and the Lakers have just not had that and it's maybe not fair to compare them to Denver from a continuity perspective. Denver's returning a lot of the same roster from last year with the exception of some of the bench pieces, obviously the same starting lineup. That lineup has played more than any team over the past two seasons, uh, but that's the bar you have to clear to win the series and to win a championship. And if the Lakers end up getting swept or losing in five games, I think a lot of it will trace back to that stretch in the in-season tournament, which to me put them in this position in the first place. Like they should not be the seventh seed. They should be playing the Clippers or the Mavericks or the Timberwolves right now. They should not be playing the Denver Nuggets in round one. Uh, so I think a lot of this goes back to season-long problems, season-long process problems, uh, guys being put in positions. Like I, I thought uh, Rui and some of his pick-and-roll defense, Like th- those are situations he wasn't even put in in the regular season. Uh, and, and now he's being put, you know, thrown into that in game one against the Denver Nuggets. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot to unpack with this and a lot we will unpack over the coming days and weeks with the fallout from this game and the, this series. Uh, But to me, the fact that AD said that uh, I thought that was really damning and also encapsulated what we've all been talking about, what we've all been observing for the full season. Uh, So Lakers are in a dark place right now. The, the, The team was very upset, very dejected A combination of angry, disappointed, sad, heartbroken, all of the sad and angry adjectives you can think of. Uh, that was that was the, the team's mood and, and energy and state uh, coming out of this game. And down 2-0, I mean, can still take care of business at home, make this a 2-2 series, but I don't see what reason we should have to believe that that's going to happen uh, based on how the first couple games have gone and really how the last 10 games have gone between these two teams. Uh, so I hate to end the show on a sour note, but I don't really know how to end this on a positive note. Uh, Lakers are in a deep hole and they got to take it one game at a time, but I'm, it's just, it's, it's hard to have confidence and belief with the way that this game went and, and really these matchups have now gone for over a year, but we shall see uh, in game three in LA on Thursday. Uh, I will be back at some point before then. Most likely I'm still figuring out my schedule it is my son's birthday this week, so I'm going to be spending the next couple of days with him uh, a bit off the grid, uh, but might have something for Thursday. Uh, if not Friday, I'll be back with, uh, or Thursday night I'll be back for sure with uh, Game 3 post-game reaction, and then uh, Friday with the second episode this week of Buha's Block. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll do a live stream or something this week. I uh, haven't done one of those in, in a few weeks. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching and listening. Uh, For those on YouTube, please be sure to follow, hit that notification bell, drop a comment and like this video if you enjoyed it. Or even if you didn't, uh, hopefully it can be a bit cathartic for you. Uh, drop a, drop a cathartic comment in the comment section. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and your podcast platform of choice, be sure to follow, download, and leave a five-star review. Again, I'll be back at some point later in the week, certainly Thursday night. Uh, If not sooner, I will talk to you then.